Thank you, and welcome to this session in our Family History and Genetics Summit event. In this session, we're going to find out about a really interesting approach to improving access to genetic testing and counseling in an upper middle income country in Asia. Many high income countries have good access to genetic services, but challenges remain in lower and middle income countries in terms of affordable and accessible services. I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Yoon Suk Yi, who is not only one of two certified genetic counselors in Malaysia, but principal investigator for the MAGIC study, which stands for Mainstreaming Genetic Counseling for Genetic Testing of BRCA1 and 2 in ovarian cancer patients in, in Malaysia. Suki, you're going to present a few slides about the study, and then we'll pick up some of the key points from there. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Clara, for the wonderful introduction. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today and tell you a little bit more about the work that we've done to improve access to genetic counseling and testing in Malaysia. Um, I am Sui, and I'm a genetic counselor. And I'd like to just start with a little bit of a description of uh, Malaysia. So it's a population of 32 million made up of multi-ethnic, multilingual um, population. So we have the Malay, Chinese, Indian, Punjabi, Kadazan, Iban, and uh, others as well in Malaysia. So I started with that because um, when it comes to genetic counseling and genetic testing, uh, it plays, there is a role in uh, the the way we make decisions, so uh, tr the religious side, the cultural side, they all come into play. But let's start with what is the importance of genetic testing in cancer management. We have traditionally always used germline genetic testing to enable accurate identification of high-risk individuals, and this is to lead to appropriate risk management. And more and more recently, for the selection of precision targeted therapies for certain cancers. Somatic genetic testing is also picking up because again, it enables selection of precision targeted therapies, for example, like the PARP inhibitors. How do we deliver genetic counseling? And especially from a low and medium income country where we have um, difficulty in accessing um, the services. So the best practice that's always been traditionally used is a referral to specialized uh, genetic services. If we wanted to increase the accessibility, we may choose to have a clinical geneticist in every oncology unit, but that's going to be difficult with a lack of um, clinical geneticists. Or we can move into more telehealth, like telephone genetic counseling, or perhaps include a genetic counselor in an oncology unit. But what about mainstreaming, which basically means training oncologists or other specialists to provide some form of genetic counseling. So this may work in a setting like Malaysia, where we have very few medical geneticists and genetic counselors uh, in order to support the needs of our population. So we started with the MAGIC study. Uh, it is a mainstreaming study of, for BRCA testing in ovarian cancer patients, and it was designed as a two-arm study. So patients are either um, provided with pre-test counseling by trained um, oncologists or gynecologists, oncologists or they are referred in a traditional route to a uh, specialist genetics clinic. So this project had two main objectives. Firstly, we wanted to determine the prevalence of BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants in a population-based cohort. And we then also wanted to compare the psychosocial impact of genetic testing for patients receiving pre-test genetic counseling through the oncology clinics compared to the traditional route of genetics clinic. So this is a map of Malaysia. We have two parts, the peninsula and East Malaysia. And as you can see, through the MAGIC study, we have managed to establish mainstreaming sites throughout the country. So every state would have clinicians trained to be able to provide the pre-test counseling. For the results of the prevalence uh, section, we know now that in our population, 13.5% of 
of all ovarian cancer patients would carry a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in BRCA1 or BRCA2. This is important because this helps us um, estimate the number of carriers there might be and the number of carrier families that we might have in Malaysia. What's also interesting is from the study, and not unexpectedly so, we found carriers in every state, in every geographical part of the country. Now, without the access of genetic counseling and testing through this study, um, less than 2% uh, of the patients actually have access to genetic counseling and testing. With this study, we have improved it to close to 60% of the patients. And you can see that we have found the carriers in every state. And what's important is that when we find these carriers, we are then able to support the management and the testing of the family members as well. In terms of the psychosocial aspects that we then looked at, uh, and compared between the two arms. We use a measure which is based on a psychosocial aspects of hereditary cancer um, uh, measure that was developed by Professor Evelyn Bleicher at the Netherlands Cancer Institute. And what we have found is that both arms actually have uh, similar outcomes. So there was um, not really a big significant difference between the psychosocial measures. And what was interesting is that when we looked specifically at what were the main issues of the patients who were undergoing testing, firstly, living with cancer still broadly uh, was the biggest problem that was reported by both arms. Next, the worry about the hereditary aspects and the worry for children were also an area of concern. Now, this is very similar to what has been already reported in uh, Western country. So whilst we felt that there would have been um, differences uh, between the, uh, the Asian cultures and the Western cultures, uh, we find that we do have uh, similarities as well. So these are the three main areas that are of concern across the board between all populations. So in summary, the MAGIC study um, told us about the prevalence, which was 13.5% of patients, are carriers of pathogenic variants. The mainstreaming um, study has shown that it can actually improve and increase the coverage of ovarian cancer patients having access to genetic counseling and testing by a very, very big percentage, so from 2% to more than 50%. Next, we also have identified pathogenic variant carriers in every site, which has then led to cascade testing of the family members. And because the cascade testing was done, especially this multidisciplinary management team, which consists of breast surgeons, gynecologists, oncologists, radiologists, and genetic counselors were then set up at this site. So the capacity building through the study was then um, something that was a very important outcome as well. So the main areas of concern for patients which include living with cancer, hereditary aspects and, uh, and the worry about children were also similar to studies for women of European descent. Now this sort of study wouldn't have happened without the uh, collaboration of many, many clinicians throughout the country. And we're very proud that in Malaysia, we were able to um, develop this study, carry it out, and have shown that mainstreaming can possibly work in low and medium income countries as a way to improve access, um, equitable access in a sense to genetic counseling and genetic testing. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sukli. Suki, and that's just such an impressive piece of work and to integrate um, genetic testing, uh, genetic counseling into clinics in such a, a short period of time. Um, I have just two quick questions, sort of follow up. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges that women in Malaysia with ovarian cancer would face, um, you know, in, in terms of accessing genetic counseling and testing before this sort of approach was, was developed? Yeah, because most of the um, specialist genetic services were all in the capital, which is Kuala Lumpur. So anyone that is geographically out of Kuala Lumpur will then have to travel all the way in. And so basically, um, that's 7% of your population which will not have access to it. Uh, on top of that, there's also the cost issue as well. So um, it was important to have a sort of under-research. Um, some of these patients were able to access the test without charge in that sense. So that also 
uh, took care of one component of worry when it comes to uh, access to testing. Thank you, and I understand that women would have re, uh, access these services free whilst the study was magic, one was happening, but that once the study is complete, that would no longer be the case? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, under the study, we could still get grants to do that. So we do have a second part to, uh, of the study, um, an extension to the uh, first magic study, and that's really to look at the willingness to pay and uh, what is the budget impact. So looking at the cost issues and how we might be able to develop a model of some point of co-share uh, payment so that more patients will eventually be able to um, afford the testing in a sustainable way um, with the help of um, government funding, for example, we do have a national health service. So hoping that with the uh, data that we get from the extension of the study, we'll be able to come, back, come up with some sort of uh, co-chair program, for example, so that the tests can be affordable in that sense. Because this would make a lot of uh, uh, difference as well, not just to risk management, but as you are well aware with the part with businesses and how uh, you know, moving forward with precision medicine, that's going to be important for their treatment choice as well. Indeed. And just actually to reiterate on that point that this, this work is really in, in Malaysia about prevention rather than, for example, access to parks, which may not be available to many women. Yes, that's right. Again, because of the cost of a new, you know, uh, like all new precision medicine, the cost of part of it is high. So it's not within the access to many, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't prepare uh, to be able to deliver the service so that eventually when um, say the price might go down a bit or there may be some other uh, payment models for the public business, we really hope that more patients in Malaysia would be able to access and uh, fully utilize, you know, this uh, sort of new, uh, way of treatment, which is, uh, as we all know, it's very beneficial and game changer in a sense for um, ovarian cancer treatment. Indeed, incredibly important. Well, thank you so much. That was just such an interesting pers uh, presentation and perspective. And we'll hear a little more about the um, Malaysia in our, our panel of event at the at the end when your colleague, uh, Professor Wu will join us. But for now, thank you so much, Suki. That was a, a, a really interesting session. Thank you very much, Clara.